Hello, my name is James Green. I'm the CEO of Magnetic, and you're listening to Rise Radio. Hello, and welcome to Rise Radio. I'm your host, Kate Christensen. Rise is a global community of entrepreneurs and innovators who are working together with Barclays to create the future of financial services. We're curious about what's new in tech and what it means for the future of money. In this podcast, we explore and explain how these technologies work and what they mean for the future of banking, straight from the mouths of the people who are trying to disrupt the industry. Have you ever found yourself on a retailer's website eyeing a new tennis racket or a pair of headphones and then the next day been reading a different website and seeing that exact same tennis racket or pair of headphones advertised to you? Well, that's what Magnetic does. They harness big data and digital behavior to personalize the customer browsing experience, including retargeting and predictive marketing. James has a lot to say in this interview about big data from ethics and advertising to cultural differences and how those dictate legislation between countries and across continents. We get a little political, a little philosophical, and you listeners will get very informed and up to speed on what's happening at the intersection of data, marketing, and machine learning. As ever, thank you for listening. With security questions, starting out, what is your favorite advertising medium as a consumer? My favorite advertising medium as a consumer, uh, this is going to come across terribly as someone who makes their living from advertising, (laughs) but I don't like advertising. Oh, really? Yeah. So the sorts of things that I love about advertising is, and it doesn't, the medium doesn't really matter, is when a really lovely idea comes up. So there were... I mean, I love the uh, the most interesting man in the world campaign mm-hmm. um, for Daisekis, yeah. and I loved the stuff in the Super Bowl. There was some toilet bowl cleaning ads in the Super Bowl. You know, things that are where the message is really interesting and grabs you. And I don't really care how it grabs me. You know, when what's the energy drink? Red Bull. Red Bull had someone on the outer atmosphere jumping out. So that's a great piece of advertising. It, so it, it'll it come to me from wherever the message is most appropriate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really not the medium. It's the message that really, that's what excites me about advertising. Unfortunately, most advertising just gets in the way of me and what I want to consume. And so I don't like most of it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good to be discerning. Yes. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about living in America? You didn't grow up here. My favorite thing about living in America is that people allow you to reinvent yourself and broadly speaking that there's very little prejudice about who you are and where you've been i don't want to say there's no prejudice in america i'm going to get like hate mail from here to eternity (laughs) right but i come from england where and i'm older i'm 55 years old and in the 70s in england and 60s and 70s in england if you grew up doing a particular thing you were expected to continue to do that and i grew up as a classical cellist Oh, wow. And if I stayed in England, I would be expected to be a classical journalist. And America allowed me to reinvent myself as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And that would have been much harder in England. And that's what I love about America, that ability to reinvent yourself. I love that too. What was your first concert? Well, my first concert was funny. Super Tramp, Breakfast in America. Oh, um, not bad. And uh, the I did this thing. Scalping is not illegal in England, at least it wasn't when I was that age, which was like 17 years old or something. And it was illegal where I was, which was Montreal, Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I went and bought a whole bunch of tickets. I was going to use a couple and I I tried to make money scalping tickets and I did it in front of the police Mm -hmm. and I was arrested and I never actually saw the concert. Oh, that's such a pity. That's such a cool story though. So that was my first concert. Yeah. (laughs) Well, getting into the interview here, you're not a traditional subject for Rise Radio because your company and technology reaches a lot of different industries, including fintech. But you have some really expert things to say about data and algorithms and machine learning. 
So I'm really excited to spend the next half hour learning more about your work and what you think about data and beyond. We'll run through questions, but could you just start by telling our listeners what is Magnetic and what does your company do? So the easiest way to think about Magnetic is that we remember uh, when you're in market for something or we learn when you're in market for something and then we know. Uh, so ways that we do that, for example, if you were to visit a car dealership website in the United States, we know. 80% probability we know. And so when you we visit, magnetic we magnetic know, we magnetic. We yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, other people also know, but all magnetic is one of the people that knows. And if you go searching for some travel, we probably know that too. Um, and sort of most places where we can cut a deal to find out that you're in market to buy something, we're there, or we cut a deal with someone to find that out. Mm -hmm. And because we're integrated with a few hundred retailers, we know your email address and so we know that it's you and so we know when you're in market we know your email address we know how to reach you through advertising and then we turn around to advertisers and we say if you're in a financial institution and you're in market to sell checking accounts or mortgages we say well we we know who is in market at the moment looking at mortgages why don't you allow us to reach them for you and we can do that either by advertising uh, mobile uh, display video whatever or digital advertising, uh, or we can do it by email, or we can also use the data to personalize your website. So when someone comes in, we can say, you know, hey, look, look at our mortgage products right now, um, because we happen to know you're in, in market for that. Uh, that's what we do. Got it. Is there a fork between types of identifying, or is it all shared between behavior-based and then predictive targeting? For example, if you're selling a mortgage to me, if you're a bank, would you see that I recently got married or had a child? And so the next step in that process, generally, if I live in a certain area that's affordable, obviously New York City um, is uniquely atrocious. <laughs> yes, that's the first thing like that comes that. to mind. Affordability in New York City, absolutely exactly. highly correlated. Just a young 27-year-old <laughs> mother <laughs> with her husband looking to buy a nice brown stone. Um, so, but do you, so do you have like predictive of, okay, we can expect that in the next three years, this person would want this product? Or I guess what's the difference between that and I'm shopping around for mortgages and you see that I'm visiting these sites and doing research? So historically, and even a lot today, people do differentiate between those things. You might run a campaign or an outreach based on some demographic information, as you said, you know, someone's graduated from college and so they need more credit cards or they're just so got married, you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> so you go, or they graduate, they've just got a new job or there's some other of that kind of information. And then separately, someone may say, well, this person visited my website and they didn't buy anything. So I want to reach back out to them. And those are pretty different types of tactics. Mm -hmm. But the way that it is heading today is that the accessibility of data is coming to everyone. And so more and more in our data science at Magnetic, and I think this is also true for anyone else who's a sort of a, near the front of the space, your desire is to have access to it all. Because you don't really know what's predictive. So, you know, yeah, you can say that because you're, as I, let's go back to graduating from college, getting your first job, there's a bunch of things you may be doing there. You're probably renting an apartment, probably getting a credit card. Yeah, but not always. Assembling a lot of IKEA yeah, furniture. Yeah, right. Yeah, but <laughs> assembling IKEA furniture, I love it. Um, but, uh, but not always and not necessarily. And people are different. People might be graduating from college when they're older. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's uh, it, it, what we find is that it's better to allow some sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence, if you want to sort of use the buzzy term of the day, to I have it's neural networks. Oh, well, the all right, so neural networks, whatever. Agree to disagree. I like machine learning. So mm -hmm. I, well, I'll stay with machine learning, you can stay with neural networks. <laughs> um, the um, it's better to feed all of this data into one uh, self aware system, and have that make logical decisions for you. Okay. Um, and that's where most things are going. So if you look at the sorts of data that is available to Facebook and Google, mm -hmm. and which is available but harder to assemble to companies like Magnetic, we want it all. I'm not going to say no to any of the things that you listed. I will buy every single part of that data in order to enrich my ability 
to have my machine learning be better. And the the crucial element of that is that algorithms, you know, and systems sort of rise to a relatively similar level. And once that happens, so our algorithms are, you know, I'll say they're better than yours or worse than yours, it doesn't really matter. The deciding factor is who has more data that's going into the system, not the system itself. Hmm. And so the more that you can feed data into it, whether it's, as you said, demographic or psychographic or a particular lifetime data, the more you can bring into that algorithm, the more accurate it's going to be. You're better off acquiring more data than you are hiring more people to improve your algorithm. Interesting. How much does browsing on like Google Incognito actually save you from sharing your data as a consumer? How does that so, actually work? So yeah, so you can, if you want to, you can be entirely anonymous, uh, at least online. Uh, you know, like it or not, now there are cameras everywhere, so it's harder to be completely anonymous. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the cameras that are at banks and the cameras that are at street corners, you know, especially in cities like London, are really in- connected. And so it's hard to really, you know, when they see you going into Abercrombie & Fitch, you know, they they know you're going shopping there, whether or not you were anonymous on crane. Shameful. Shameful. So, I would never. <laughs> so, so it, you know, you but you can absolutely anonymize yourself. Mostly, mm-hmm. people have found the reward risk reward ratio isn't, or the the effort reward ratio isn't worth it. Very few people go to that level to do it, but you can. Mm-hmm. It's totally possible. Yeah, I do appreciate as an avid consumer of e-commerce that the advertisements that are coming towards me are very relevant and right. um, haunting even yeah. <laughs> beautiful things I've looked at, lingered on and can't afford. Wish you could afford. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll have to figure that one out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How has data science as a field shifted over time? Feel free to editorialize on this, but if we could group it into epochs around the supercomputer to the personal computer, to the era of the smartphone, What's become available? What's made it a lot harder on your end to digest data? And then what's made things easier? So, yeah, so artificial intelligence first came of age, I think I think it was back in the 60s. I'm pretty sure that date's right. With some IBM scientists who invented a language called Lisp. Mm -hmm. And it was the first programming language where you could use a data set as an instruction, Hmm. which is sort of an interesting idea, right? So you you write this thing, you come with an output, and then you can use the output as another instruction. It was the first language that would do that. And through the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, people really tried to create what you think of as artificial intelligence. At least when you say that word to me, I think that's an artificial thing that thinks like I do. And that reached a dead end in the 80s. People tried to invent rules-based systems. They thought, well, people live with rules. And so we're going to try to create these rules-based systems. And we're going to try to recreate human thinking. And the systems didn't work. <laughs> they really didn't work. And and in the 80s, artificial intelligence got a terribly bad name because none of the systems that they were building ever actually worked. And it regressed and started calling itself machine learning. And now this machine learning has grown up. And what's happened into the 90s, if you were going to get a computer to make a decision, it sort of cost you in the order of magnitude of 10 to 20 cents a decision, just Mm. in terms of hardware. Today, that decision costs at least three or four zeros before you get to a digit. Mm -hmm. The number that I remember from a data scientist telling was E to the negative six. (laughs) It's not a big number. (laughs) And so what's happened is that uh, just with the famous... um, IBM computer that won in chess and the famous uh, deep mind computer that won at Go, these systems are not like people. People are, uh, are good at pattern recognition. And we sort of, I'm aware that I'm in a studio and I'm talking to you. And so I sort of can ignore lots of other things and focus on what's important. Computers have none of that ability. And what, what we're doing because of this dramatic fall in the ability to make a decision, they are, they're like idiot savants. They go and they say, what would happen if I did this and this and this and this? And what's the logical conclusion after 50 moves? Okay, now I'm going to do all the other permutations in every single place. Imagine you're in one place and you walk in every single possible direction. 
And that's how the computer would find out how big the room is by making all the mistakes it could possibly figure out. And then it comes back and says, oh, now I know exactly how big the room is. Now, that totally doesn't work as a human. And it's a very, very different way of thinking. But that creates these very interesting systems. And so that today is how artificial intelligence works. It is not like a true human system. And the reason these systems are so very necessary is I look at what we do where I said, you know, just give me more data. We consume approximately a million pieces of data a second, right? So think about that, a million pieces of data a second. And lots of financial systems do similar kinds of things. I would argue the two largest consumers of data in the world are financial systems and advertising systems. And there's no way that a person, even if it's collated by a computer, can absorb that amount of information, but a computer can, right? And so the person has to write these very narrow rules about what the outcomes you want are and what data might be interesting. And then the computer iteratively goes through all of that. And so it's less about whether a computer has been a handheld computer or a laptop computer, more just about the raw computing power that you can gather. And most of these systems are now in the cloud because you require many, 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 many machines in order to go through that much computational power. Do you have opinions on shaping the learning algorithms and how bias can be built into those based on who's writing the code? Yeah, so there's some very interesting stories about that. So one which I would have your listeners Google were they use machine learning to figure out how to aggregate everything, right? So mm -hmm. go to Google and, and type in three white teenagers mm -hmm. and then do the same thing and Google three black teenagers. And the results are terrifying. So when you Google three white teenagers, Google's gone through and aggregated all of these pictures and you click on images so you see the images as opposed to the text results. Mm -hmm. You'll see three happy-go-lucky people, maybe at a beach. I'll do it right now. Yeah, I'll go do it right it. now. Three white teenagers. If you go three black teenagers, you'll see three black people on a lineup in a mugshot. And so absolutely, is there bias in our system? Oh, yeah, we've got soccer, football. Right. You have three white kids mugshots. You do, but then compare then it to the three black, black teenagers. teenagers. Yeah, it's all very... So is there bias in our system? Absolutely. There are all yes, there bias. is massive bias That's in our horrible. system. So, you know, and why is that? That's because humans have prejudices and those prejudices get into the system, mm -hmm. you know. And so you're only as good as the data that you're putting into the system. That's crazy. Yeah, I agree with that. So, you know... So it, is there an emerging field of data ethics... Or machine learning. Yeah, ethics. for sure, for sure. And and, so who's the tastemaker there? Is you it know, up to academic institutions? No, I mean you you see you've seen that play out already with Facebook and fake news. Yeah. I mean you know, it's ha you know, the people who are going to be making the differences here are the largest most tech savvy companies, right? Because you I would even argue that if you there's been a couple of things that have happened in, in terms of technology over the field, and I think this is absolutely relevant to anyone in finance at the, today, which is that once upon a time, you know, the big thing was moving everything into the cloud, right? And so people, some people thought, no, I can still run my own machines. Pretty clear now, better off in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? So now what's happening is every single person needs an AI. I can absolutely guarantee you that the jobs that are going on at the moment are going to be changed by AI. And it is as big as moving into the cloud. An example of that, if you are logging into a system, if your job consists of the following, you log into a computer system that gives you some insights. And based on those insights, you go and make some other decisions by emailing people or going to log into another system. Your job will change because those two systems will become connected and AI will do your job better because it will look at more of the data. It, you won't have to, you know, you're taking a few variables and making the decision. They'll look at all the variables and make an unbiased decision. Mm -hmm. And then they'll just tell the other system what to do. Well, this brings me to my question about robot takeover. How will any of us have jobs in the future? And how will 
you know, economies maintain broad employment when robots are making people obsolete. So I, I do or worry about that. does this just that. mean like leisure? Like, does this mean we get to just go on vacation? No, 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 no. Okay. We can, we can dream <laughs> about that, but we're not going to get to go on vacation. And, and in fact, you know, one of the reasons humanity has been so successful is because at our core, we actually like producing things and like doing things and like working, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we say we would all rather be on the beach. We're pretty good at working, really, as, yeah. a, as a race. I think, and it's obviously personal conjecture, because the data has not spoken, right? So that there's no one in the world that can tell you exactly the answer to that question. But historically, there are some examples that we can look to about what's happened and what's changed. And I'd say one way to look at it is manufacturing, right? So what's happened to manufacturing? Manufacturing has become radically automated. So the number of people in a, uh, in a car factory is much less than it was 20 years ago, yeah. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And yet employment in some sectors anyway is pretty good. And unemployment in this country is, is pretty low. But some people have been hurt badly. I mean, this, is, this is, shouldn't be used to anyone. We just had an election that is sort of based on this <laughs> premise, yeah. you know, yeah. for better or worse, whichever side of that you're on, mm -hmm. it's pretty clear that a bunch of people became disenfranchised. So it's not that there won't be jobs. It's that who can do those jobs? And there's some very frightening statistics out there. So one of the things that we, uh, we love to say and we love to feel and hear is that, oh, these people who are now not needed and their skill set isn't appropriate to what we need today, and we'll just give them some retraining. And uh, we'll, we'll retrain them in the new system so that they can have the technical knowledge or the wherewithal to work with the robots takeover, right? Which mm -hmm. I don't think that'll ever happen because uh, at least not in our lifetime. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you can die first and then it'll happen. <laughs> but the scary statistic I read was that an analysis of manufacturing cities where people went and got retraining versus people who didn't get retraining, the outcomes were worse for the people who got retraining. Why? Because they weren't any good at it and they didn't want to do it. And the people who didn't retrain just went, they made less money. Both sets made less money mm -hmm. and were unhappy. But the other people found a way to muddle through. and, and, and so that, But that's the problem. It's not that there won't be work. It's that it'll be different work. And the people that are displaced – how are we going to treat them in, a, in the United States versus other parts of the world? We feel very strongly that we should not support people who can't support themselves. It's sort of a, a big part of you know the American dream. You can make it. Yes, you can. And if you don't make it, it's your fault. And that's a, a serious problem as we automate these things because the skill sets we'll need will be different. And there'll be massive opportunities for employment. And big parts of society won't have that skill set. And I, I do not have the answer to that. <laughs> if I did, I'm sure I'd be vastly more successful than I am today. <laughs> but I, I don't think it's that the robots are going to take over. It's that some subset of society is going to go through the same thing that happened in manufacturing. And we've seen it happen. So why won't it happen again? That's a really interesting elucidation of the problem. I would be really <laughs> curious to hear a solution for it. It gets you, very political after that. It, so. Yeah, it yeah, gets so, super political. Do you I, see... And I don't know whether your listeners don't care or want to know about oh, that. Oh, I'm sure they'd eat it up. It's really good for ratings to say controversial stuff, if there's anything I've learned in the last year of observing other media. Well, we can go there. I'm happy. I have opinions on what you could do. Do you, geographically, do you think that cities that are trying to establish themselves as tech hubs, like you see Charleston and Raleigh-Durham and a lot of places that are in less populated states close to college towns though or like that are college towns saying we're the silicon valley of the south or the silicon valley of the midwest or the silicon alley of new york city i hate silicon anything but um you know the last thing we're trying to be is californian here in Flatiron. but do you see that as a vain attempt or as a hopeful attempt at resuscitating these it, 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 disenfranchised So the areas. idea that you as a leader in your community should try to make your community a tech hub is probably something you should do. How likely are you to be successful? You're going to have to have a lot of other things going for you. It's going to have to be a place where young people want to live. You know, I think Austin has a very good chance of making itself as a big, good tech hub. 
there's good music scene, there's good restaurants, you know, despite their fights with Uber and Lyft, mm. you know, I think they, they really do stand a chance. But you, it, just declaring it is not going to be enough. It's going to have to be affordable. You're going to have to have some core thing that starts it. If it's an empty shell, you're going to have a very hard time filling that up. Right. And you'll never be Silicon Valley. Like you, it's impossible. They're so far ahead, and the network effects of having people who are at the pinnacle of their of their field located all near one another is so compelling that they'll pull further ahead of you. But you got to do it. It is the future. If you don't do it, your people become disenfranchised. So yeah, mm -hmm. there is no choice. And sooner or later, in the United States. Some more radical things will happen. So if you think about us as a more right-wing, right-leaning country where it's sort of, you know, to sort of steal New Hampshire, live free or die, right? That, That's a that, great license plate. <laughs> that captures that American ethos in a really sort of… One hundo P. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. This is still the country that had the New Deal, mm -hmm. right? And so… There are still things that we do in the end that are not quite as live free or die, right? And so this country did install Medicare and Medicaid. We do have Social Security. There are going to need to be systems in place. There are some experiments now where everyone gets this, uh, a fixed wage no matter what you do in some cities. In, and it's a city in California. Forget which one. Sounds like California. <laughs> Where and it, it's been tried. There was a city in in Canada that tried it, and one in Europe that tried it as well. Where everyone in the city gets exactly the same wage, and then you see what they do. Uh -huh. And and evidence says that most people still work. You know, I'm not saying that this country will go that extreme, but we will have to find a way to support the people who become disenfranchised. Really interesting. What do differences in data laws and policies between different countries tell us about attitudes towards consumer privacy? Getting back to the um, yeah, yeah. data so, side of things, yeah. we'll take a breather from robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's three ideas in the world, I would say. I'm sure there's more, but I'm going to go with three. Mm -hmm. The United States, Europe, and totalitarian regimes, okay. like I'm going to say Russia and China. Right? Okay. In the United States, we believe that your data should be isn't really yours, that Magnetic should use your data however it can get it. There are some things we, we're not allowed to do, I think quite appropriately. There's you know HIPAA laws and various other things. But, but by and large, if it's innocuous, then the data is free. In Europe, the mindset is entirely different based on prejudices that grew out of the Second World War, uh, where certain racial groups were fairly seriously sought after, identified and persecuted, and killed. The laws are much more on the individual side to protect their privacy. And it comes from that place. It comes from the fact that in Europe, still in, in a generational lifetime, there are people who lived through that who are alive today still, yeah. right, 1945 to today, mm -hmm. um, uh, who say, you know, I don't want the, uh, anyone to know who I am. And so there's much, much tighter laws, and that's where it comes from. So it's a very different attitude. That hasn't really, really happened here in the United States, despite McCarthyism and various other things. Mm -hmm. We still kind of feel like, you know, it's okay. <laughs> the totalitarian is they, they, the government owns everything. We're going to find everything about you. It's ours. No one else gets it, and we're going to use it against you. Like that's, those are the three different kind of ideas uh -huh. that are out there in the universe, and the laws in those three places are similar. So, in totalitarian regimes, there are no laws. Pretty much, it's power, and so the people in power have everything. In in the United States, there's a lot of freedom, and with the current administration, there's becoming more freedom uh, to collect data and use it. And in Europe, there's less. Uh, there's more protections for the individual. And those are the reasons that those three things exist like that. That was super interesting. Do you struggle then with clients who are marketing to consumers in the US, but also in France and Germany and the UK, as far as being really accurate with your targeting and retargeting? Uh, yeah. So we have chosen to focus primarily in the United States and Canada. Okay. Um, so 
We do are do. Canada's laws really similar to? They're the more they're more similar to the United States than they are to Europe. They're a little bit in the middle, but okay. sort of two thirds towards us and one third towards them. Mm -hmm. Typical Canada. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we love you guys. <laughs> the nicer American. The, <laughs> <laughs> we do run campaigns in Europe. There are more stringent laws about it, but generally speaking, you can abide by them and you can still run a good, healthy business. An example of that is in Europe, you must ask the consumer permission before you remarket to them. And so what all the... Like you always get a pop-up that says... Yeah, so that's what happens, right? So then when you go to a website, they say, well, leave the website if you don't mean to remarket and you have to click yes and it's okay. And once you've done it once, you've given acceptance. And then that website can grant that permission onto a vendor like ours because you've given your permission. So from a user point of view, it's sort of one extra message you get and everyone just says yes. And very few people say no to that, sort of sub 5%. Hmm. So the, although the laws are there, you can pretty much do the same thing. How much should a company know about a consumer? Like what should be off limits? You mentioned HIPAA laws are important to respect. Yeah, so we, we've thought a lot about that. And I'll tell you how we've thought about it. And, and maybe this can guide some of your other uh, listeners about how they should think about it. We believe that every system in the world will be hacked. And so what's the consequence of being hacked? And so when you're hacked, how will you hurt people? And so we don't store any data that will hurt anyone when we're hacked. In other words, you could publish everything that we've got and it wouldn't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't think it'll hurt. It'll, you might find out that I bought a dress or you know, maybe I'm a cross-dressing guy. I mean, I don't know if that'll hurt you or not. Not me. <laughs> but we only know, you know, you'd only find out that you bought these particular things. So we don't store things that could hurt you, passwords, right? So we don't store passwords. Financial information that can be used to buy things, credit cards, other credit reports, credit ratings. We don't store that information. Health information, right? So that someone has AIDS or someone, you know, we don't store any of that information. And that, that's the criteria that we use because, and I think I, I'm, I'm going to say we're right, your system will be hacked. Every person who's listening to this show, at some point, your system will be hacked. Mm -hmm. We see attempts on our servers every moment of every day. And, you know, we're pretty good with security. I think we're better than most, but we're not the best. It's not our number one thing. And our defense was don't store stuff that will hurt someone. It's a good rule. How have you seen big data transforming the world of marketing? Are there any brands that are most savvy among their peers in this regard? Yeah, so I, um, I'm going to be uh, probably not very controversial on this answer because I think the people who are most savvy are Google, Facebook, and Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> they are the people that continually show some really, really amazing things. And just because I picked on them, I'm going to give one other example who is perhaps someone you don't think of as most savvy, but I really like what they're doing, which is uh, Walmart and their acquisition of Jet. Oh, yeah. Talk uh, more about that. And so what, what they've done, so what, one of the things that for anyone, I'm going to assume everyone's shopped at Amazon yeah. and received a big cardboard box with a little tiny thing in it, right? So that's it. I recycled it. Yeah, it's great, but it's pretty inefficient. Yeah. Right. And so one of the things that Jet is doing with Walmart is, and I'd encourage you all just to go. I'm going to give free ad to Jet here. I have no <laughs> affiliation whatsoever. They're not a customer. Well, Walmart is, but I get no money out of it. But I'd encourage you to go to Jet and try this out. What they do is based on the efficiency for them they will pass on some of the savings and promote products. So imagine for a moment that you're going to buy, I don't know, um, a, a, a jeans and a pair of sneakers. And one, I imagine that a lot. Yeah, so it, you're going to buy them from Walmart for whatever reason. One pair of sneakers is physically located right near where the jeans are in the warehouse, and the other pair of sneakers is located across the country. They'll sell you both, but they'll promote the one that's closer and share the reduction in cost with you, hmm. which I think is really a very interesting use of big data. Yeah, and it's also a way that totally subverts all like branding and yeah. everything that the yeah. sneaker company is trying to create. Yeah. That really throws a wrench in the process. Yeah, 
Okay. So, so that's an in, so that's yeah. sort of a more interesting, different kind of approach to to big data. I'd love to round out this interview by picking your brain about data driven decisions and decibel driven decisions. And I'm wondering where you see data misleading. One of our recent interviews was with Anand Sanwal, who's the CEO of CB Insights, which is a data company, and uh, something that they bring up a lot in their research is they call it the pundit industrial complex. And a lot of companies make decisions based on these really loud pundits and not necessarily on the data available. There is something to say for these gut decisions that perhaps disagree with the available data, but often they're misguided. So what do you see as the balance between data-driven and decibel-driven decisions? And are there times when data tells you to make the wrong choice? So I'm a, you know, I'm a nerdy, geeky guy at heart. You know, I, I learned to program in college. And, and so I'm going to go pretty much hardcore on you've got to have data to make decisions. But there are some exceptions, but they're not the exceptions that people use. Right? So people use as an exception. I think we've all seen, again, whichever side of the aisle you're on, we've seen political arguments that are based on decibel. Absolutely. And, and not data, right? So that's not a place that you can use decibel versus data. Places where you can, and I think is interesting, is creative. So there are definitely examples of industrial design and art and creative ideas where the data says you should do one thing because that's what's been most successful. But the idea that's going to cut through the clutter is going to be entirely different and untested kind of by definition. Mm -hmm. And so we see, you know, I think Apple is a great example of a company that sort of lives by this ethic. They're like, we know, we know what we think is right and we don't really care what else is in the market. I used to work for Steve Jobs in another lifetime over at Pixar Animation Studios. And he's very, um, he's, he's quoted as saying when he, took over Apple for Act 2 um, as saying, people would ask him, you know, what's Apple going to do? And this is a point where they're only making computers, right? They're not making, they didn't invent the iPod or any of these things. He said, I don't know. I'm going to wait for the next big thing. And that's not a data-driven decision. <laughs> it's just not. Yeah. Uh, and so there is definitely a, a way to go out and think about your products that doesn't have to be data driven. But when it comes to making decisions for millions of people or, you know, what your customers like and don't like of existing product sets, this is not a gut decision. <laughs> you yeah. can absolutely, you know, get your net promoter score together and go, <laughs> go to market with it. You know, I mean, that there, most things should be data driven, but there are these, that type of exception. But I think people use those exceptions for the wrong reasons. Well, I'm really excited to keep watching how Magnetic uses those things for the right reasons. Thank you. And promotes them. Thanks so much for your time, James. It's my pleasure. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning in. If you're new to Rise Radio, welcome. This podcast exists to demystify fintech. We have some fantastic interviews with founders and leaders of companies like CircleUp, Betterment, TransferWise, Techstars, Amalgamated Bank, and so many more. If you want to get a grip on what's going on in fintech in an approachable and hopefully amusing way, subscribe and please share with your friends, colleagues, clients, your parents, and we'll catch you at the next episode. Until then. Thank you.